it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you all, all about these exciting legislative developments for mutuals. Um, it's been a long time coming. So as you all know, um, the Mutual Reforms Act took effect in April um, and brings to life key recommendations of the Hammond Report. Um, it's great news for you guys because it means that you can raise equity capital without risking your mutual status, as, as we've all heard. Um, e and even if your constitution has um, demutualisation approval requirements, you've got the opportunity to amend your constitutions and issue MCIs without needing to comply with those requirements. So the upshot is that you'll have much greater flexibility to fund your businesses um, and, in the case of mutual ADIs, of course, to raise common equity tier one capital for capital adequacy purposes. <coughs> of course, legislation alone won't create a market in MCIs, and so as um, Greg and Peter have been, been saying, um, it's going to take a lot more than legislation and coming up with um, uh, doing a bit of lawyering and coming up with a, with a capital instrument, but this is truly a significant step towards making capital raising um, for mutuals easier. Um, I think I need to... Ah, that's me. <laughs> um, so I am here to talk to you about how to make your um, constitution MCI enabled. Um, and my key message up front is about the special procedure. I really want to stress that because um, it's got uh, a sunset period. So you've got a special procedure to amend your constitution to allow for MCI issuance, um, but it only the special procedure is only alive for three years um, from when the Mutual Reforms Act took effect. So that means you've got until April 2022 to make use of it. Um, you also only have three attempts to do so. Um, so I would strongly encourage you all to to get on and have a look at this because it's, um, it'll be much better if you can take advantage of the special procedure. It won't stop you um, amending your constitution because the fact that we've now got a definition of mutual entity um, in the Corporations Act does mean that it's um, you're not at such a greater risk of demutualising under the Corporations Act, but nevertheless, um, you'll be, it'll be much better if you can make use of the special procedure. Um, so it's available to mutual entities, and we'll come to the definition of mutual entity shortly, um, who are public companies who don't have voting shares quoted on a stock exchange and who are not charities. Um, uh, so I think we can now move on to who can use it. So in order to use the special procedure, you need to be a mutual entity. Um, which uh, both Greg and Peter have touched on what that definition um, is, but I'll just go over it again. Um, so a mutual entity is a company under the Corporations Act which has a constitution which provides that no person has more than one vote at a general meeting um, in each capacity in which it is a member. So what does that mean? Well, essentially, it means that each member of the mutual must have only one vote um, at the mutual's general meeting, um, which may seem simple, um, but of course you may have in your constitution um, provisions around joint memberships and representatives, and so the legislation makes it very clear that it's okay um, if joint members each have a vote, um, and it's okay for a member to have another proxy um, or representative vote as well. Um, so, and I, and I would encourage you all to have a look at the explanatory statement for the Mutual Reforms Act, because it includes some good and fun hypotheticals to help you work through um, making sure your constitution satisfies the no more than one vote requirement. Um, holders of MCIs can be given voting rights as long as they only have one vote, regardless of the number of MCIs they hold. Um, the Mutual Reforms Act seems to contemplate that holders of MCIs um, will be members of the Mutual for the purposes of the Corporations Act, um, and it's open to mutual entities to allow MCI, MCI holders to be members under their constitutions. But it's not a requirement, so the Act also makes it clear that mutual entities are not required to treat MCI holders in the same way as they treat 
their members who don't hold MCIs. So I think that's important from a, you know, maintaining your mutual character point of view. Um, <clears throat> so who can issue, oh sorry, next one. Who can issue um, MCIs and I guess more specifically, what do you need to do to your constitution in order to issue MCIs? Um, so in order to issue MCIs, you also need to be what's defined in the Act as a, an MCI mutual entity. Um, that is, there are additional requirements on top of satisfying the definition of mutual entity in order to issue MCIs. Some of those are, you know, in the character of your business itself and others are, you know, depending on what changes you make to your constitution. So, um, in addition to being a mutual entity, you must be a public company under the Corporations Act, so not just a company but a public company. You must n not have voting shares quoted on a stock exchange and you must not be a charity. So these requirements are the same as those which make the special procedure available. Um, in addition, to be, as I mentioned, to be an MCI mutual entity, you'll need to amend your constitution. Um, a bit like preference shares, certain provisions which apply to MCIs must be included in a mutual entity's constitution. I would argue that this is where any similarity between preference shares and MCIs ends, although I'm very happy to discuss this. I know it's, a, um, it's an issue of interest to a lot of people. Um, amendments to your constitution will not result in a demutualisation under the Corporations Act if you follow the special procedure and ensure that the amendments don't result in you no longer satisfying the mutual entity definition. In other words, as long as you stick to being a company with no more than one vote per member, then you wouldn't demutualise. So what provisions does your constitution need to contain? Well, not many. There actually aren't very many provisions that need to go into your constitution, which I think is great, because it really means that the, the, the true design of the MCI is reserved for the terms of the MCI outside of your constitution. So, um, but nevertheless, you need to have some provisions, about four, in there. So the first one is a bold statement that the mutual is intended to be an MCI mutual entity. So that's just um, making that clear in the constitution. Um, then you need to have a couple of provisions which say that the MCI can only be issued fully paid, dividends are non-cumulative if they're payable, um, and the, the rights attached to MCIs with respect to participation in surplus assets and profits. Um, so as I say, there's not a great deal that actually needs to go into your constitution, um, and it's relatively straightforward, I'd have thought, to now get those provisions into your constitution because you've got the special procedure that you can use to do that. So, how does the special procedure work? Um, so it can be used by a mutual entity to propose, um, and here we have yet another defined term, which um, lawyers love, uh, to propose an MCI amendment resolution to members of the mutual. So an MCI amendment resolution is a resolution to amend the constitution for one or more purposes, so it's quite specific. Um, you can't use it other than to include that statement um, that you intend to be an MCI mutual entity, um, to provide for your, you to issue MCIs, and also to provide for rights and obligations attached to the MCIs, although it is not necessary to include all of the rights and obligations because they can go into the, separately into the terms of the MCI. Um, there is also a bit of a catch-all, which is that you can make other changes which are um, incidental or ancillary to those things. Um, so the MCI amendment resolution, there's a, there's a provision in the Act which says the resolution mustn't result in the entity ceasing to be a mutual entity. And of course, this would only be the case if the resolution proposed that a member was to have more than one vote at a general meeting, um, which wouldn't be permissible anyway, given the parameters that are put on what you can put to members in an MCI amendment resolution. So I think that's um, for an abundance of caution that, that was included. Um, notice of an MCI amendment resolution has to be proposed 
um, at a member's meeting, sorry, notice has to be given in accordance with a, pr a particular provision in the Corporations Act, which is 249L1C, for those of you who um, are interested. Um, this means that the notice has to set out an intention to propose the resolution and state the resolution, or state what the resolution is. So as mentioned earlier, and um, I know I'm harping on about this a little bit, but the meeting has to be held within three years, um, i.e. by April 2022, in order for the special procedure to apply. Um, and it has to be passed by 75% of votes cast by or on behalf of members who are present. Um, and I think the great thing is that if that resolution is passed, it has effect despite anything that may be in your constitutions now, which requires you to do something else, say, to give effect to that resolution. So I think that's extremely helpful. Um, so once you've got your constitutions enabled for MCI issuance, then you, you can turn to the design of the MCI, or I, I mean, I suppose in reality, you will be looking at the, what the terms of the instrument will look like you know, at the same time as, as, as proposing the amendments, but obviously you need your constitutions to be enabled before you can go ahead um, an issue. So we're currently working with a couple couple of you on, on terms um, of an MCI and it'll be great to hear from all of you um, on what you think the MCI should look like. <laughs>